Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast. I'm Cameron Christensen, along with our co-host, Anthony Faso. And today, what we're going to be talking about is whether you should be buying your real estate inside your IRA or outside. Many people want to buy real estate because it's a key asset to achieving and creating financial freedom. But the issue is that most people have their money tied up inside of the IRA, and so they're using those funds to buy real estate. Anthony, I got to ask you, you're the CPA, right? What do you say when someone asks you if they should use their IRA to buy real estate? I say do it. Just take the money out, pay the tax, then buy the real estate. Mm, Even if somebody has to pay a 10% penalty, do you still give that recommendation? You you mean the 10% privilege tax? I've never heard privilege tax. Well, actually, I just (laughs) made it up. Okay. okay? Okay. And But as I was preparing for this... Mm -hmm. It, it kind of bugs me, and, and it should bug you, is that if you want to access your own money, you have to pay a 10% privilege tax to get it out mm. if you're younger than 59 and a half, mm. in addition to the tax. But I would still say yes, even after you pay the 10% privilege tax and the income tax, that you should still take it out. I'm going to ask you one more question here before we get started is... Mm-hmm. Why do you think that most people are using IRAs to buy real estate? I think what it is at the beginning, I think people aren't really investors. Is like you like to use the term speculators. Mm-hmm. They're just doing what they're told. Let's fund, let's let's put money in our 401k or our, our IRA. And they believe that that's the only way to save for retirement. Mm. But what I think is interesting, IRAs have only been around uh, since 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 the eighties, I mean, so people were saving for retirement before that. But I think what happens as they start getting educated, maybe they're maybe they're losing trust in in the stock market, yeah. or they remembered what happened in two thousand eight and think something like that is right around the corner. They start looking for different ways to make money, or and a lot of them probably started reading Rich Dad Poor Dad. And is talking about uh, real estate as a great tool for financial freedom. I'm like, okay, great. I want to buy real estate, but that does take capital. Where's my capital at? Well, it's here in my IRA. Yeah. Well, and what maybe not everybody knows is that you can convert that IRA to what's called a self-directed IRA. And then that will allow you to invest in a lot of different assets. One of those is real estate. So people are doing that using their IRA because that's where the money is. Mm, that I totally agree with you. That has absolutely been my experience over the years is that most people get started saving and they put it into the traditional kind of qualified plans. And then real estate is almost an afterthought, mm-hmm. right? They come across and they're like, man, I want to do that. But then they realize that all their money is in these types of accounts. And so they try to find a way to invest inside of those. And what we're going to talk about today is really, is that the best account to be buying real estate? And as we dive into it, really, Cameron, what are some of the advantages of real estate? Well, there's a lot. Uh, Number one, I'd say cash flow, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You get immediate income now today that hits your pocket that you can turn around and use again. I would say the tax advantages uh, that come along with that. And then I'd also say the ability to leverage, right? So you can put a little bit of a small down payment and secure a very large asset. Exactly right. The problem is when we put this in a government controlled account, we lose all of the we lose all of those all of those advantages. Absolutely. And I'm excited to kind of see what we've come up with here today. So what do you think, man? Let's get started. Like what I like to I mean, if you're probably listening listening to this, you're like, wait a minute. That doesn't make sense, right? The numbers don't work out. You in particular or just no, you. All right. No, but Spot. What we like to say here is that we do the math. Yeah. Or we're not just going to talk theory. I mean, we're going to dive into the numbers and really go into is this better or not by going through the numbers. Yeah. So we're going to the numbers. This is a podcast, so we're not going to dive too deep into the numbers. But you know what? Anthony is a nerd. And mm-hmm. so he will be providing an in depth analysis via video that we'll post to our YouTube channel. So make sure you go check this out, follow up with us there where he's going to walk you through the numbers and uh, we will be sure to add the link to that video in the show notes today. Okay. So 
let me kind of set up what we are looking at. What we're going to say is we have, we're going to try to keep the math simple for you, Cameron. <laughs> Thank you. Round, well, num- round numbers. Yes, yeah. round numbers. And really for you, but more importantly for me, right? So let's say we have $100,000 inside an IRA and we decided we wanted to invest in real estate. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare two scenarios. Uh, one is going to be inside the IRA. So we're going to take that $100,000 and invest in real estate. Yeah. Scenario two, we're going to call outside. And there, we're going to take the $100,000. And again, we're going to try to be super conservative. And we're going to say that you're in the 40% tax bracket. Okay. Okay. But with the 10% privilege tax, <laughs> that's 50%. So your 100000 Went down to 50. Okay. So just to be clear, mm-hmm. we're going to, the first analysis, right, is going to be inside. We're starting with mm-hmm. $100,000 inside an IRA. The second analysis is what we're going to call outside, which is we started with the 100, but what we did is we liquidated it, paid the 40 in taxes, mm-hmm. 10% penalty. So we end up with 50. And so that's going to be where we start. So 100 inside, 50 outside, right? Correct. All right. Now, Cameron, I first want to thank you for not busting my chops for it. I just did the first sound effect I ever did in our podcast when I went. <laughs> okay. So I was waiting for a, sm- for a smart comment. It's okay, coming. So it's thanks. coming. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah. You're not off well, the hook yet. Okay. So correct. Now what your first thought is that there's no way that I'm going to have more money investing with 50 than I am with a hundred. Not a chance. Uh-uh. So let's do the math. All right. Okay. But remember one of the biggest advantages we talked about, with real estate is the ability to leverage. Mm-hmm. And when it's inside an IRA, our ability to leverage is limited. And the reason being is outside the IRA, you can do like a traditional um, 30 year fixed mortgage. Okay. Right? With about 20% down. Okay. Now, and that's because you, you, you're on the hook. Right. Mm-hmm. If you don't make that payment, they're gonna they're they're, they're gonna come after you personally. Yeah. Now inside an IRA, y- you can't co-sign on that mortgage. So there's there's nobody backing it up in case you don't pay. Thus, there's a bigger risk to the bank. Mm-hmm. So banks are really good at migrating their risk and Mitig- they're go- mitigating. Yeah. Mitigating. Thank you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they're gonna do it by two ways. Mm-hmm. For one. They're going to charge a higher interest rate. Yep. Okay. So in this example, we're going to say outside is 5%. Yep. Okay. But inside is going to be seven. Okay. But also uh, this type of loan is called non-recourse. Again, meaning that they can't, they can't come after you. So in addition to a higher interest rate, they're also going to demand a higher down payment. Okay. So what we're going to assume is that we're going to have to put 50% down. Okay. Versus versus twenty. Now, when when we do those numbers, now inside the IRA, fifty percent down with a hundred thousand dollars doesn't take a rocket scientist or a, an ex Paul Mitchell student to know <laughs> that that's two hundred thousand dollars. Now, if we put twenty percent down, a fifty thousand dollar down payment will buy you a house that's two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. Now, what we're also going to assume is that there's going to be some sort of appreciation. All right. In this example, we're going to be conservative and say it's 2%. Okay. So 2% is is pretty conservative, right? Mm-hmm. So if the appreciation is higher, it would, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it'd be more advantageous, advantageous to have money outside of the IRA, correct? Right. Because would you rather earn 2% on 200000 or 2% on 250000 Mm. Right, and as you said, if the appreciation is higher, then the then, then the numbers are going to be higher. Okay, so okay. conservative numbers. I'm with you. Mm-hmm. Right. So right off the bat, if we appreciate at 200, uh, your appreciation is going to be four grand. Okay. All right. Now, two percent of a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house is going to be five thousand. Okay. So appreciation, we're already a thousand dollars ahead. Okay. Okay. Now, what what we're going to use is a net operating income is going to be is going to be six percent. Okay. Thus, inside the IRA, that's going to be twelve percent because that's of two hundred. Twelve thousand. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Twelve thousand. 
outside, it's going to be 15,000. Yeah. Right. And again, because we have a higher value. So we, so we are making, we're, we're making more money. And to be clear, is that before or after the debt payment? This is before okay. the uh, debt payment. Okay. Now, again, what we're, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. Mm-hmm. So the numbers we use is assuming that we have an interest only loan. Okay. Right. And, but if, if, if even if we were to fully amortize it over 30 years, you're not paying much principal yeah. over that. So we're, we are just kind of kind of rounding that. Okay. But now uh, your interest on that you're paying inside the IRA is going to be 7%. Okay. Okay. Because that uh, is 7,000 because that's 7% of the loan. That's 100. Now your loan outside's higher. It's 200,000, but the interest rate's smaller at 5%. But so your so your interest expense is going to be ten thousand dollars. But when we incorporate all of that, like the bottom line cash flow after all of that, inside is thirteen thousand, outside is fifteen. And what about any tax implications here? Haven't even talked about that yet. Okay. But we 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 are going to because that's what what I find interesting. Our cash flow is higher. Mm, yeah. Right, we bought, we invested fifty thousand versus a hundred, but we have more cash flow. Mm. Right, that's the power of the ability to leverage and having that having that lower interest rate. But remember, one of the other advantages are the tax advantages, and the the a big piece of that is the depreciation. Okay, right. So we can take, we can depreciate, meaning we can we can make deductions against that cash flow inside the ira there's no tax advantages yeah okay but outside we are going to have we are going to have depreciation okay so once we include all of that and again it's trying to compare apples to apples inside the ira that there's still a lien to the irs yep right so what we're going to use is we're going to say that we're going to take that cash flow, that appreciation, and if we were going to take that out of of the IRA, so we're going to pay a uh, uh, forty percent tax. We're not assuming a ten percent penalty. Okay, right? We're just assuming that because whatever you have in there, you're going to owe the IRS. It's mm-hmm. just, it, it it is just a matter of when. Yep. Okay, so after a forty percent, your your net return on that on on that investment is we're going to be left with $70,000. Okay. So that's inside inside. We're going to have about $70,000 after we, after we, after we pay off the lien to the IRS. Now outside, this is a lot more fun Mm -hmm. because we have that depreciation. Mm -hmm. When we include that, we actually have a loss, a loss of $5,000. Now, again, if we're in the 40% tax bracket, we're getting a refund. Of two thousand dollars, when we include all of that, our total return outside is seventy two thousand mm, dollars. Okay, so let me see if I can summarize here. Right, so inside we have a net return of seventy thousand, mm-hmm. and outside, after paying the tax, after paying the penalty, we actually have more. We have seventy two thousand. Is that right? Correct. Wow. Okay, so after one year, we're already ahead. Yeah, like That's- isn't that? That is impressive. Isn't that cool. Yeah, I yeah. mean, and we just started. Yeah. So let's. Uh, all right. So let's keep moving. What happens next with the cash flow inside the IRA after after the after our income and expenses and interest? Cash flow inside the IRA is going to be five thousand dollars. Outside is also going to be five thousand hmm. dollars, which to me I, I think is interesting. It is interesting. Right, we're we're starting with 150, but the cash flow is the same. Yeah. Okay. What about taxes at this point? Have we mm. taken that into consideration? Taxes are a big piece, particularly when in, in inside the IRA, because in order to compare apples to apples, you know the money inside or whatever balance you have inside your IRA, there is a lien. Mm-hmm. You you're going to owe taxes to the IRS. So what we did in this example is we're assuming that. Whatever the, the the net income and net assets are, 
that we're going to we have to pay the tax. So we're assuming that that that's at your marginal tax rate. And again, in this example is forty percent. So we're not including the privilege tax. Mm-hmm. We're just saying uh, if if you pay off the lien to the IRS. Now, when you do that inside the IRA, we're going to have sixty five thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. Now, outside, this is when it gets more fun mm. because now we have the beauty of depreciation. So we can actually take a deduction against that cash flow. And when we do this in this example, we're actually having a loss of $15,000. So again, at the 40% tax bracket, you're actually getting a refund of $6,000. So if we go back to the cash flow, maybe it was the same, mm-hmm. but we just we just saved another six grand in taxes. But uh, the total return outside in the IRA is going to be sixty six thousand mm. dollars. Okay, so let me see if I can summarize here real quick. Yeah. Okay. Number one is Anthony thinks depreciation is, depreciation is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, inside we have a net return of sixty five thousand. And outside, even after paying the tax and paying the penalty, we have just a touch more. We have about 66000 right? Mm-hmm. So after you're one, we're already head or just about even, right? Yeah. 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 That's interesting. I would not have guessed that. But that's just... So year one, we are ahead. Yeah. And what's, also, what's also interesting, we're comparing the outside. We, we paid the privilege tax. Yeah. And we are still ahead. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now let's talk about what happens year two and going forward. Okay. To try to keep things as simple as possible, what we did, we made some assumptions, and that is that whatever the cash flow we had from year one, we had the ability to take that and buy a very similar asset with the same leverage and the same interest rate in year two, and we did the same in year three and four and so forth. Now, when when we do that, at the end of year two, inside, we're going to have $68,000. Okay. Now, outside, we're going to have $85,000. Okay. So, year two, we're making a jump. We're pulling, pulling away. Yeah. yeah. And, now, and uh, now, if we jump to year seven, that's as far as, as, as we went on this example. Inside, you're going to have $87,000. Which I don't think is terrible because we paid off the lien to the IRS. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So when I hear 87, I want to kind of jump in here mm-hmm. and let's see if we can explain this. When we say 87, that's kind of the net, what you're walking away with at the end of seven years, right? Mm-hmm. And so the number that we started with when we began was 100,000 inside that IRA, mm-hmm. but it really wasn't 100, right? Right. Right. Because we had some taxes and stuff that we haven't paid yet. So really, it would be like you started with 60. Would that be considered? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So we start with 60. Seven years later, we walk away with 87. Right. Correct. Okay. Perfect. I, I would say that, that that's okay. I would say. Yeah. I don't think too many people would get excited about that, but it's a right. very conservative uh, play for someone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we can do better. Really? Okay. So just refresh, what we did is we started with $100,000, paid the tax and the, priv- and, and the privilege tax. So we really ended up with 50. But at the end of year seven, with the ability to leverage and with the tax savings, we were able to turn that 50000 into $281,000. Okay. So that is impressive, mm. right? That will get somebody's attention. I, I I should hope so. <laughs> awesome. Can we do any better? Yes. Okay. Tell us how. We can do better. And that is by incorporating the infinite banking concept. Okay. Right? Because the problem is in this example outside, when we took that $50,000, we drained our account, bought the asset. But then when we drain our account, Cameron, how much interest are we earning on that? Zero. Zero. We broke the compound interest curve. Now, with infinite banking, we never drain the account. We leverage against it. So we continue to earn money on our, on our cash value, even though we are using it. Mm-hmm. 
So if you want to learn more about this and how we can incorporate the infinite banking concept, great way to start is to get on a, a discovery call with us. Yeah. We're going to be on there for 15 to 30 minutes, talk about your goals, answer some questions, and see if this is a good fit. Absolutely. Right? A link for that, of course, will 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 be will be in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Right. But there's also some other advantages, right? Of storing your capital outside an IRA. Wait, I just felt like it was kind of that Ron Pupil moment when he's like, wait, wait, but there's more. Yeah, well, yeah, wait, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So what is what else is there? I, I would say a couple things. For for one, you're gonna have a lot, you're gonna have more fees in se- when you do a self directed IRA. Yeah. There's fees to the the trustee of the IRA, but you also have to create an LLC. So there's gonna be costs to set that up and costs to maintain that. And also, you have to be very careful not to commingle funds. Yeah. Right. What happens is a lot of times people they they leverage as much as they can in their self directed IRA, and something happens, meaning they need to do a new AC unit. Yeah. Or there's some vacancy and they can't pay the mortgage. And what they do is they dip in their personal pocket and start paying some of those. Mm, and when you commingle those. There's huge amounts of penalties to do that. So you always have that burden. Yeah. But probably the most advantage of having it outside is a lot of our listeners were trying to create financial freedom. Yeah. Right. And to do that, we need to have passive income is more than your monthly expenses. But you can't create cash flow inside the IRA. Great point. I was going to add on on to that. That's probably that is the number one deterrent when I looked at self directed IRAs and when I've seen them over the years is I've had clients that have come to us that have them, and when you look at it outside of everything you just mentioned is that when you look at what you can invest in, it's a very uh, defined uh, window of what you can put your money mm-hmm. into. At the end of the day, essentially, it's there's you can put money into something as long as there's no personal benefit. Mm-hmm. Right. And what I mean by that is you can't buy like an investment property and go stay in it for a month out of the year. Ooh, good point. Right. So there's good no point. Yeah, there's no personal benefit to that. And then also the same thing, like you'd said, is you can't take cash flow off of it. And 99% of the time, those goals don't align with what our clients are trying to do. And so if you find yourself in that situation, we've got a solution. Right, is we've been helping people get out of that solution for a long time now, and we can certainly give you some options. So if you guys are interested, feel free to reach out, book that discovery call, like Anthony said. And if you want some more information or some of the more detailed notes uh, as Anthony goes through this, is man, make sure you go to our YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe. We'll put a link in the show notes, but that's going to be the best kind of follow up resources to go watch that video. Perfect. Awesome. Well done, Anthony. Well, thank you, Cameron. Go make it a fantastic day. Take care.